And without further ado, I don't really have to introduce him as much as he already can speak for himself. So please listen, take notes. Like I said, if you have questions, we're going to open that up once he's done talking. So here is Bill Ayers. Mic check. No, no. Uh, Mic check. You don't know what to say. Let me try it again. Mic check. Okay. In, in, I can't even teach you something. In the Occupy Wall Street, one of the things they, one of the great innovations they have is a thing called the human microphone. Have you been down to the Occupy Chicago or the Occupy? Occupy Rockford. <laughs> I've been occupying Milwaukee, Chicago, Detroit, and New York. So when in the, they have this thing called the human mic microphone, and that's because they're not allowed to tire up. So what they've developed is this great thing called the, which is very participatory, very democratic. And what they do is they start by saying, mic check. And then everybody says, mic check. Let's try that. Mic check. Mic check. check. Yeah. And then the, a person has to give a speech in little one sentence bits because it gets repeated all the way back. And it's like a game of telephone, you know, where by the time it gets to the end, did she say eat worms? You know, <laughs> whatever, you know? But if you get down to Occupy Chicago, and I do recommend it, uh, Chicago is the weirdest because it's just a street corner. It's not a space, like a park, just a street corner. But if you get down there and you get to speak in the uh, General Assembly or something, here's how you start. You start by saying, mic check, and everybody. Mic check. check. And then you say whatever you want them to say back to you. You look great. You, you look, look great. great. I love you. I, I love, love you. you. No, really, I love you. No, no, no really, really, I love you. you. That's what you do if you get to speak at Occupy Chicago because it's a lovely feeling to have all these people shouting at you and you look great. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk a bit in a minute about the Occupy movement, but I want to, I want to begin by kind of uh, setting the stage just a little bit. Um, Adam and the others had asked me to talk a bit about democracy and the crisis in democracy. And I think, you know, it is, it is true that we're living in troubled and terrible times. And I guess the first thing I want to say is that I, I was looking at you all, those of you who were graduating, you looked way too happy um, because there are no jobs. I think you know that. <laughs> that there are no jobs. Um, and, and that that's the world we're living in. We're living in a in a society in pretty deep crisis. And the crisis is sometimes, you know, relatively difficult to take, but easy to describe. You know that unemployment in Detroit is 50%. That's the unemployment rate in Detroit. Um, that, that debt is massive, and that we've lived, for a person my age, I'm in my late 60s, I lived at the peak of everything. The peak of oil, the peak of prosperity, the peak of, you know, of, uh, of everything in this country, and it, that was all based on debt, and we are going in a different direction. So if everything was leveraged when I was coming up, everything's being deleveraged as you're going down. So we have to look squarely at the world that we're inheriting. We are, all of us, people of this generation, and we should look very uneasily at the world we're inheriting. Foreclosures, poverty rates. Poverty rates among the elderly, and I am among the elderly, are going to double in the next 10 years. Double in the next 10 years. Farms are the new meth labs. Uh, a, a, there's a desolate landscape out there, a hollowed out landscape. And we are witnessing, again, the kind of turning around of a, of a moment of great uh, prosperity and, pro and, and promise. Um, and the political class has no answers. There are no answers that they're offering. So we see these debates and the debates in the Republican primary are sterile and empty and ridiculous, but the debates among the Democrats and the Republicans are equally um, difficult and, and, uh, and in some ways, um, you know, meaningless. They don't have an answer uh, to the problem. Um, the average tax cut to the top 1% last April was larger than the average income of the rest of us. That's a frightening thought. And that's why the Occupy Wall Street thing has some things very right. 1%, 99%. That articulates a feeling that is very, um, very deep in the 
in the land. So the question we have to kind of grapple with in this landscape, and we can talk about it a lot more, is what is to be done? What are you and I going to do? What are new college graduates going to do next? And I said, you know, it's over, there are no jobs, and I was only partly joking. But we have to make a distinction, for example, between a jobs economy and work. There's a tremendous amount of work that needs to be done. Education, taking care of the elderly in particular, and the young, um, rebuilding the infrastructure, rebuilding housing. These are things that have to be done. That's real work, and that's work planting gardens, taking care of ourselves. These things have to be done. But that's very different than the notion of just getting a job, any job. So when our mayor, Rahm Emanuel, says, oh, I have a great jobs program, and he's talking about casinos, or building prisons, we should object and we should say there's enough important work to do that we want ourselves to organize ourselves and be involved in the important work of the world. So this is some of what we're witnessing, what we're facing now. And I think that what we have to do, all of us, but I think I'm speaking particularly to educators and, and I think some of you in the room at least think of yourselves as political activists, and all of you are citizens and residents. All of you are citizens and residents of this country. And the requirement of being a citizen or a resident or an activist or even a moral person is that you have to be able to describe the world as such and you have to be able to see standing next to that world a possible world. You have to either be able to tease out or invent or imagine a possible world. And that's what it means to be a moral person, it seems to me that you have to see and seek and create alternatives, imagine alternatives. It's not enough to describe the world as is. We have to be able to say something else is possible. And that means resisting the kind of deathless phrase of Margaret Thatcher who invented the phrase, there is no alternative. This is it. And yet that's a very common feeling. This is it. There is no alternative. And so let's take a quick glance at history. If we had lived 150 years ago, 160 years ago, and let's talk about, let's, let's just identify the white people in the, in the room. If we had lived 160 years ago, would we have been opposed to slavery? You're all opposed to slavery now, right? Yeah. Say it, yes. 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 So I was worried, geez, I either put them to sleep or they're not opposed to slavery. Yes, you are opposed to slavery, of course. We all understand that now. Just like now we all think Nelson Mandela is a hero, right? Not when he was fighting for, for freedom in jail, but now we understand that he is. So the question is, 160 years ago, would we have had the courage to stand up and say, we're against slavery? And actually, Mark Twain, for one, said, you know, um, he has a little essay called Free Speech is for the Grave. And what he says is, um, you know, none of us want to be thought ill of. And that's why we go along, we conform. We just go along with whatever is. And, and the killer example he uses is slavery. He says many of us are opposed to slavery, but to stand up against it is to stand up against the Bible, your preacher, your parents, your neighbors, your friends, your political party, the Constitution, the law. But you would have done it, right? You and I. Let's give ourselves a break. We'd have been Stone cold abolitionists, right? Yes. Correct. Right? Yeah. Okay. Let's hope. And you're also for a woman's right to vote, right? Yes. 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 Yeah. Yeah. yes. Yeah, you're scaring me because I want to make sure I'm in the right space. You're for a woman's right to vote, of course you are. But a hundred years ago, if you'd been for a woman's right to vote, you would have been against the law, the Constitution, the founders, your parents, the Bible, and your preacher. Could you have done it? Some did, but most didn't. Some did, but most didn't. Similarly, we're all against Jim Crow. We all think that that's a terrible system. But I'm old enough to remember when people went along with it because it was normalized, it was common sense. And I raise these examples simply to say, are you aware of what's going on in front of you right now? Like for example, if your grandchildren said to you, you know, 50 years from now, your granddaughter says to you, is it true that you were around when the first African-American president was elected? And you could say, things turn out okay, you could say yes and smile, but I know. And uh, were some of you in, in Grand Park uh, when he was elected? 
Uh, I, I don't remember seeing you there, but <laughs> you're all there with the other million people. Um, you could say yes. In fact, you could say yes, I was around when he was elected. In fact, I was in Grand Park. Nobody will know. Is there really? Yeah. <laughs> um, she won't be able to find me. And then she'll say to you, but is it true, Grandma, that it cost him in 2008 a half a billion dollars to get elected? And you'll say, a half a billion? Really? Yeah, yeah, I read it in the history book. It cost him a half a billion dollars. And you call that democracy? And you'd say, yeah, but he raised it on the internet. She won't buy it. That's just nonsense. He raised it on the internet. And not only did it cost him a half a billion dollars in 2008, whoever gets elected in 2012 is going to cost a billion dollars. And you call that democracy? I'm not saying this will happen. I'm saying this is the kind of thing we should wonder about. What we take for granted, we should wonder, is this normal? Well, we've normalized it, so it is normal. But is it sensible? Is it ethical? Does it make any sense? Or another way. When your granddaughter says, is it true that when you were at Northern Illinois University that there were two and a half million of your fellow citizens in prison? You say, two and a half million? Yeah, not only that, some of them were in prison within miles of your campus, just a few miles of your campus. And you'll say, no. Yes, here's the map. Here's the reality. Here's the, here's the chart. It's true. And again, this all depends on how it turns out, because who knows what will be true 40 or 50 years from now. Two and a half million people in prison, and you took that as normal. Is it true that when you went to Northern Illinois University that your country was the only advanced Western democracy that had the death penalty? Is that true? And that actually killed people? And that you had a, a, a credible candidate running for, for uh, president in the Republican side who said, that he had no doubts that when he executed 250 people, he never had a sleepless night, didn't give him a moment's pause. That's normal in our society. It may look like craziness and insanity in another perspective, but to us, that's all normalized. 